Technology is made by humans for humans, and today we're exploring where these worlds collide. From Egyptian mummy reconstruction to detecting digestive gases to 3D printed body parts. I'll be in the driver's seat trying out a new app, and you can make a game to test yourself with this DIY. All that and more coming your way. Greetings, techie humans. Today's theme of people and technology has got me thinking about the tech involved in one of our favourite pastimes, sport. There's plenty of tech in sports equipment and sports clothing, but even when sports people aren't competing, they're still using tech in training, like gym equipment to help strengthen muscles or motion tracking technology that allows them to examine their technique more closely. And when brain injuries occur, whether in sport or elsewhere, doctors need a way to detect them. And here's someone who might just be onto something. When it comes to treating brain injuries, medical science has come a long way. But the equipment we use to diagnose brain trauma, like an MRI machine, is expensive and impossible to transport. So we've come up with a more portable diagnostic tool. Hi, I'm Constanti, and this is a brain injury detection helmet. Our brains are delicate and very complex, so any brain injury like a stroke or a heavy impact is extremely serious. If a blood vessel in our brain ruptures, the faster it's detected and treated, the better the patient's outcome. But many patients who suffer sudden brain injury can't get to hospital quickly for detection and treatment. That's where our brain injury detection helmet comes in. It's a portable imaging system that allows us to see if a bleed has occurred in the brain. It relies on electromagnetic sensors. There are 16 of them around the head and four above. These sensors are small antennas sending and receiving low intensity electrical signal, which scans the brain in seconds. Each sensor is mounted on a movable rod so that it can be quickly adjusted to anyone's head size. The system works thanks to dielectric contrast. That's where some matter, like blood, appears more dense to electric fields than other matter. So, a hemorrhage will show up darker than the healthy tissue surrounding it. To pick up this contrast, each sensor sends and receives signals into the cranium, up to 200 pulses per second. All of this data is collected and processed in the control box. This control box is a switching network, ordering and making sense of those hundreds of pulses and sending the data to this laptop. There, we use software to turn the data into an image of the brain. It's like taking a slice for closer inspection, but with no pain, no surgery, and no risk to the patient. Our helmet is capable of detecting brain hemorrhages as small as one cubic centimeter, and it can accurately locate its position in 3D inside the brain. The brain injury helmet has other benefits too. We 3D printed the components of our helmet, including the frame and the mounting attachments for the sensors. So our design is highly cost-effective, super lightweight, and very portable. That's important because it means our helmet could become a standard fixture in ambulances, remote medical centers, and even sporting stadiums. And that could change the future of brain injury treatment, with rapid detection giving patients a much brighter outlook. What type of tech do you use to get around? Since the invention of the wheel, humans have been developing new ways to use it. You'll see versions of the wheel in everything from a bike to a train to a plane. Many of us get from place to place on four wheels in a car. And I'm about to meet someone who's making driving safer. So Fabius, we're here at a driving simulator and you actually develop apps for drivers. Why did you decide to do this? People already use apps while driving. And if you think about it, that's pretty crazy. Some people, they even check social media while driving. And that's obviously unsafe, it's distracting. So how do you make driving more engaging but also not distracting? Right, so I don't know about you, but I like to play video games. They're pretty fun. So we were interested in whether we could draw inspiration from video games. There's a couple of elements that make them really fun. So for example, uh, there's competition, there's rewards, there's challenge. So we were thinking maybe we can make safe driving fun by making it a bit more challenging, by having rewards, maybe a bit of competition as well. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the idea, yeah. 
And what does that look like when you've got a game that makes driving safe? Right, so there's a couple of things that you're meant to be doing in order to ensure safe driving. For example, you're meant to uh, keep an adequate distance to the car in front. And in the very early design stages of this project, um, we imagined, for example, the car in front to be a zombie. Obviously, you want to avoid a zombie, and that's how you keep, maybe, people from keeping a safe distance. Now, the current idea is actually about uh, speed keeping. But enough talking about it, let's try it out. This app challenges the driver to reduce their speed to a new speed limit by the time they reach the sign, but without using their brakes or by coasting. It was difficult at first. I didn't get any points because I was at like 42. But it was very satisfying once I got the hang of it. Yeah, Beautiful. I got three stars. <laughs> That, so that's really satisfying. And there were other benefits even when I wasn't approaching a new speed limit. It does make me more like aware of my speed. So that was a lot of fun to try out. How did you actually test whether the app was doing what you wanted it to do? Right, so we invited a couple of people in and we had them do a drive with the app and without the app. So then we could compare. Um, and in order to compare, we measured a couple of different things. So, for example, we've got cameras in the car and they tell us where people are looking. So, for example, whether they're looking at the road or too much at the phone. So that tells us about visual distraction. One of the other things we did is we attached electrodes to people's bodies and that tells us about physiological signals. For example, we recorded heartbeat, which is uh, one of the indicators for engagement. Okay, and what did you actually find out from that? Right, so I think it's really interesting. Um, we found that during these um, challenges, the coasting challenges, people got a bit excited. So overall, we, we saw more engagement. But um, what's interesting is that the engagement was sustained throughout the entire drive. So even between the challenges, people were more focused on staying in their lane? That's correct, yes. And um, it's important to remember though, this was just a study in a simulator, so we'll have to try it in the real world as well and see what happens there. Coming up, there's a helmet detecting brain injury and how steady is your hand? Find out with this DIY game. Welcome to Scope, where we learn all about the world and ourselves. Today is all about humans and technology, so let's begin by meeting some humans who are studying humans of the past. I'm talking about archaeologists. Archaeologists dig back into human history, from the fossils of our earliest ancestors to the remains of buildings like this jail from the 1840s. There are even marine archaeologists who specialise in studying shipwrecks. And speaking of reconstructing the past, let's use some clever tech to step back in time to ancient Egypt. Ancient Egyptians left us lots of clues about how they lived, from paintings to pyramids and of course mummies. But what we'd love to know is what they actually looked like. Hi, I'm Janet. And I'm Jennifer. And together with a team of forensic and anatomy experts, we've brought back to life the head of an ancient Egyptian mummy. When the head was discovered in the museum's collection, nobody knew much about it, and it was up to us to uncover its history. In the old days, we used to have to unwrap mummies to find out more about the person inside. However, today we can use new technology to look inside. The machine we use to do this is known as a CT scanner. It uses x-rays that take really detailed images of the body. It can show things like bones, blood vessels and muscles. We used this machine on our mummy head, which then allowed us to look through all the layers of wrappings. The scan shows us the bone structure of the mummy, which can tell us that she was a woman. So we gave her a name, Merit Amun. Next, by analysing the data of our CT scans, we were able to create a virtual 3D model of the skull. From this, we were able to print a full 3D version as a base for our recreation. 
Then I use forensic science and a knowledge of facial anatomy to rebuild Marita Moon's face in clay. Just like a face, every skull is different. So with this 3D printed skull, I had a base to apply the methods normally used for forensic facial reconstruction. For this process, I applied clay according to the arrangement of muscles on the face and anatomy ratios. To help me with my measurements on how deep the tissue needs to be, I also use measurements taken from modern day living Egyptians. With all of this information, I placed markers across the skull at specific points, then built up the clay at those markers. I then had to look at clues to help me build the ears, the nose, the lips and the eyes. The position of her teeth could tell me how the lips and mouth would sit, and I estimated what her nose would have looked like using calculations based on the nasal cavity. I placed prosthetic eyes in the bony orbit and based her ears on the CT scan images. Then we added the finishing touches based on how we thought an Egyptian woman at the time would look. So thanks to a combination of technology, anatomy, forensic Egyptology and sculpture, we have the amazing face of Merish Amun. Some of the steadiest hands in the world belong to surgeons who specialise in hearts, brains, eyes and other important parts of the human anatomy. But how steady is your hand? Why not test it out with this DIY technology? Most electrical appliances use circuits to get the electricity they need. And that's what we're going to be experimenting with today. Hi, I'm Millie and I'm going to be making a steady hand game with the help of an electric circuit. You'll need an empty container with a plastic lid, two AAA batteries, a battery holder for the batteries, an LED, a pin, stiff unshielded wire, flexible shielded wire, thick tape, wire cutters, needle nose pliers and the help of an adult. To get an electric current to flow, you need to have a closed path or a closed circuit. For example, most lights use a switch to open and close the circuit that connects it to its power source. When you turn a light switch on, it creates a closed circuit, which allows the electric current to flow, causing the bulb to light up. But when you turn it off, it creates an open circuit, which stops the current from flowing, turning the bulb off. So let's see how we can use these circuits to our advantage. The first thing we need to do is use our pin to make a small hole on each end of the container's lid. Then you can get an adult to use the wire cutters to cut off a piece of the stiff wire. Feed the wire through the holes on each end of the lid and then shape it into a curvy design. Next up, use the pin to make two small holes where you want the LED to sit and push the LED into place. Then use the pliers to attach the wires from the battery holder to one of the LED leads and one end of the curvy wire. Then you can use the duct tape to secure those connections into place. Now we can poke a larger hole in the lid where we want to place the flexible wire, which is what we're going to hold during the game. Get an adult to cut a piece of the flexible wire long enough so it can attach the LED on the underside, come through the hole and move across the entire curvy wire. Then get them to strip the end of the wire that will attach to the underside of the lid. Thread the wire through the hole on the top of the lid, keeping the stripped part of the wire underneath. Attach the stripped wire to the remaining unused LED lead and secure it with the duct tape. Then you can get an adult to strip the other end of the wire on the top side of the lid. Finally, you can use your fingers to wrap the stripped wire around the curvy wire so it forms a circular loop. Now when the loop touches the wire, the LED should light up, but when the two aren't touching, the light should stay off. That's because when the two are touching, it creates a closed circuit, but when they're not, it creates an open circuit. 
The object of the game is to follow the curved wire path using the loop of the wire without letting the two touch. So, in order to win, you have to take the loop from one end to the other without it lighting up. You can make the game easier or harder by simply changing the size of the loop. So thanks to this simple circuit, we can create a steady hand game that really tests your skills. Coming up, there are gas capsules telling us more about the human digestive tract and there's 3D printed body parts. Today on Scope, we're getting technical about humans. Like, did you know that technically you're never alone? Our bodies are home to millions of microorganisms, like bacteria. Hmm. So, where on our bodies do these microorganisms live? Whoa, that's a lot. And this ecosystem of microorganisms is called the microbiome. But it's perfectly normal to have microbes living all over your skin. Most of them are harmless and some can even be beneficial, preventing disease-causing organisms from colonising your skin. But for now, let's focus on the hand. These are the microbes of the unwashed hand of someone who owns a pet. There are different kinds of bacteria and fungi growing. And here are the microbes of the hand of someone who's washed them. It sure does make a difference. Your microbiome is different to everybody else's and there's even a whole community of microbes living in your gut helping you digest food. But now let's take a look at a story packed full of even more info for you to digest. Our bodies need fuel. Bodies digest food as the fuel to give us power and sustenance. And this digestion also makes different gases, otherwise known as farts. And these farts can tell a lot about what's happening in our guts. Hello, my name is Kurosh, and our team has created a gas sensing capsule for measuring these farts before they leave our bodies. The gastrointestinal tract is the path food takes as it moves through our body. From our mouth, down to our stomach, to our intestines, and out the other end. And if we can measure these gases, we can see how diet can affect our bodies and whether our bodies are healthy or not. And this is where the capsule comes in. The capsule is basically a miniature computer. It's made up of gas sensors, which are similar to smoke detectors in our houses. These sensors can pick up carbon dioxide, hydrogen, oxygen, and methane. The capsule also has a small batteries, a microcontroller, a wireless transmitter, and a spiral antenna. Once you swallow the capsule, it takes the same path as your food, down to your large intestine, and at the same time, it sends the data out to a receiver. Every five minutes, it encodes the gas data, send it as a signal that is transmitted to a little receiver outside the body. This receiver can fit in our pocket and connect to our smartphones. Then we can read the data straight from our phones. Let's look at one example in which low levels of gases might be a problem for our body. The microbes in our guts break down fermentable foods such as potato and onion and produce hydrogen gas in the process. This is normal. However, if our gas capsule tells us there is no hydrogen in our guts, but we have eaten lots of potato and onion, then we know something is wrong. It means there aren't enough microbes in our guts, which means the food aren't being broken down properly. Too much gas means too many bacteria. The undigested food molecules or too much food digestion can both be potentially harmful to our bodies. In the future, we hope to take these capsules to doctors, hospitals, and health professionals to take a closer look at the gases of our guts. Yes, our guts sure can get gassy. But while we're on the topic of the human body, let's check out some medical tech. 
like the Da Vinci robot that helps surgeons to operate. It has four arms that can hold many different tools and use them with high precision. And another type of tech with a deep knowledge of the human anatomy is the 3D printer. Wondering what I mean? Well, keep watching. The body is an amazing machine with hundreds of bones, muscles, ligaments and tissues connected to make us complete. But not all bodies are lucky enough to stay in one piece. Hi, I'm Icky. We're using new technology to help heal and replace broken body parts. Every bone in our body is grown to perfectly fit our skeletal system, connected by muscles and ligaments. Some body parts, like the nose and ear, are made from cartilage, a smooth elastic tissue. And sometimes, bone and cartilage are shattered, injured or destroyed by disease. And these body parts, like people, are unique. So to replace them, we need to make tailor-made individual solutions, like my nose here. And to do this, we use a combination of 3D medical imaging, modelling and 3D printing. To look inside someone's body, we use a CT scanner. It takes a lot of images in thin slices of bones and other body parts. These images are layered together in software to create a 3D image we can work with. Once we have these images, we can see where any damage has occurred. Here we have scans of someone's jawbone, the mandible. A part of the jawbone has been destroyed by cancer and needs to be replaced. We isolate this part of the bone and create a template of this area. Because it is damaged, we use its mirror image, the other side of the jawbone, to help us recreate the section using our modelling software. We then have a model of a new piece that can be inserted into the jawbone to replace the damaged section. Next, we model the entire jawbone, including the new section, and print it out. We can examine a 3D printed jawbone against a print of an original jawbone scan with the damaged section and see how it fits into the model of a patient's skull. And while these parts are printed in plastic, when they're ready for surgery, they'll be printed in titanium, a material suitable for medical implantation. Titanium is great for printed body parts as it is biocompatible. This means it won't corrode inside the body. It's also really strong, which is great because we use our jaws every day. And these models are also a great learning tool for future surgeons, so we can continue to help piece people back together. Well, it's not humanly possible to squeeze any more tech stories into today's episode, but we do have time for just one quick recap. We use tech to reconstruct an Egyptian mummy and make driving safe and engaging. We made a game to test how steady your hands are and we detected brain injuries with a techie helmet. If you want to see more, then you're only human, so check out our website. Or join us again next time to learn the science of yourself, the world and the universe, where the ordinary becomes extraordinary under the scope.